I, I think that pets humanize the president. You, you see these people, they're on the news, and most of the time they're in a suit and tie and they're, they're speaking about these policy details that we don't quite comprehend or don't have the same amount of knowledge on. But then you see them on the White House lawn, you know, romping around with their dog and you feel like, oh, okay, he's a person just like me. John Adams was the first with animals in the White House. He had a dog named Satan. Theodore Roosevelt uh, had the most pets. He had a couple of dozen, but he had snakes. He had a one-legged rooster. He had a badger. Teddy Roosevelt had flying squirrels. Jefferson had bears for a while because, um, you know, at that time, we had the Louisiana Purchase, and there were animals out there that people on the East Coast had never seen. And so for a little while, he had grizzlies in a cage on the, on the South Lawn. Martin Van Buren had tiger cubs, which he kept in the White House for a brief period of time. Calvin Coolidge had a raccoon named Rebecca, and they allowed her to roam around the White House. She was supposed to be Thanksgiving dinner. Um, uh, a supporter of Coolidge's in Mississippi decided, uh, you know, like, let me send the president some raccoon for Thanksgiving. And of course, when the Coolidge's open this package and see there's a live raccoon, they couldn't imagine like, okay, let's bludgeon this thing to death and bake it. So they, they kept it as a pet and they, they got her a little collar that said White House Raccoon. You know, the, this tradition does go back. In fact, uh, James Buchanan and Abraham Lincoln were offered elephants by the King of Siam, but they were declined because, uh, you know, Lincoln said that there was, our climate wasn't suitable for elephants. Some of it is probably currying diplomatic favor. One of my favorites, actually, though, is Pushinka, who was a dog given to the Kennedys by Nikita Khrushchev. And the story goes that uh, they're at a summit in Vienna in June of 1961, and Khrushchev is sitting next to Jackie Kennedy at dinner, and he's telling her about these Russian dogs that they've sent into space, and they've returned them from orbit safely. And one of the dogs has recently had puppies. And she says, oh, well, you, you must send me one of these puppies, you know, just sort of the offhand kind of thing you say to somebody. But two weeks later, this dog shows up at the White House with a Russian passport, and they had to bring the FBI over to search the dog for bugs and explosive devices and all of these things. But Pushinka ended up becoming, uh, you know, part of the Kennedy family and had puppies with one of Kennedy's dogs. The, the fascinating part about this to me is that I've actually read um, articles arguing that Pushinka is perhaps in part responsible for Kennedy's decision not to go nuclear during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I, I love the idea that this connection between these people caused because of a dog is subconsciously there in the back of Kennedy's mind as he's working through all of these scenarios with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and with, um, you know, with his cabinet. So, you know, it's possible that presidential pets have, uh, you know, have saved all of our lives or our ancestors' lives anyway. <laughs> I, I do think a lot of politicians, when they get animals, it says something about them. Teddy Roosevelt having so many animals tells us a lot about who he was as a person in terms of his love of science, his love of nature, and wanting to understand how animals worked. This little girl in Kansas was like, hey, Mr. President, do you want a badger? And most of us would say no, but not Teddy. Um, Teddy loved animals. He was a naturalist or thought of himself as a naturalist. So he took this badger back and they built a little habitat. <laughs> the pets kind of play into that same sort of relatability argument. Whether that's the best way to choose a president, I'm not sure, but it is definitely something that people take into account. Now, as these folks were campaigning in the primary, they realized, hey, there's as much interest in my dogs as there is in me. I mean, people were taking selfies with Elizabeth Warren's dogs at her campaign events. Because when you look at the dogs, regardless of how you feel about a person's political ideology, we can all look at a dog or a cat and we can say, oh, that's cute. And it's a way of drawing people in. Mike Pence having, um, you know, the rabbit Marlon Bundo, who has an Instagram account. I think that softens Mike Pence's, you know, kind of harder edges as well.
someone tried to offer President Trump a golden doodle named Patton, uh, he declined that because he doesn't like dogs. We get a lot of comments on our Facebook page whenever I say that Trump doesn't have any animals. We get a lot of people who are angry, like animals wouldn't like him, good for the animals. So whether or not that's actually based on any kind of factual assumption or whether it's just, a, a, you know, this sort of thing that's baked into our culture that animals only like good people, um, you know, people do make these extrapolations. They, they do make judgments based on this kind of thing. Major is the first shelter dog who's going to live at the White House. And that kind of reflects modern conceptions of ethical pet ownership and, you know, the, um, the safeguards we need to have for animals. There's been this push over the last several decades to adopt your animals rather than purchase them.